Carmelite Sisters, 1A, take one. Is that is that loud? Thank you so much. <laughs> so my name is Sister Grace of the Trinity, and I've been in Carmel since 2001. I made my solemn profession in 2007. Beautiful. Mm -hmm. All right. And why don't you tell us a little bit about the, the community of Discalced Carmelites, like whatever mm -hmm. information that you want to share that's like, that's really beautiful about the community as a whole. Sorry, I'm I'm nervous. <laughs> <laughs> we cut it all into smaller pieces. Okay. Um, all right. Um, so if I if I share a little bit about the Carmelite Order, the Carmelite Order is um, looks to its origins from Elijah. So it actually has Old Testament beginning, and then the the Carmelite the name Carmel is from Mount Carmel in the Holy Land. Um, when we think about our our order, we really looked to the first hermits that lived there on Mount Carmel in the spirit of Elijah. And that's where we get the name from. So it's not actually after a religious founder in the sense that like the Dominicans would be named after St. Dominic, the Franciscans after St. Francis, but after a place. And the place is, is the sacred space where the first hermits found their life of prayer and um, a really unique way of fighting actually the Lord's battle. So this would have been at the time of the Crusades and um, there were men who felt called to be living like hermits and living um, a life of solitude on Mount Carmel, in the area of Carmel. So the, that tradition continued and Teresa of Avila eventually came to reform, reform the order of Carmel. Um, but she took that tradition and then she, she renewed it and um, she was the one who gave the name Discals to the reform. So when we talk about Discals Carmelites, we look to Teresa of Avila as our founders. Um, John of the Cross was helping her at that time. And then Teresa Lisieux is the most famous, the most well-known of the Discals Carmelites. And we continue that tradition of prayer then. Beautiful. Mm -hmm. All right, so can you tell us a little bit about the charism of, of your community and how you serve the, the archdiocese mm -hmm. in particular? Sure. So our charism is one of contemplative prayer. We are a cloistered order. So we're women who seek God, who seek the face of God um, in a radical way, really, where we don't have other apostolic service to the church. Um, we're uniquely set aside by the church to pray, to pray for the needs of the world and of the church. So. Our service is a service of prayer and a service of um, silent prayer, mostly. Um, but we pray liturgically. This is, you know, the center also of our of our life. So the liturgical and the and the silent prayer, our service, our service, yeah. Beautiful. All right. And so, for you personally, sister, when and how did you feel that call to consecrated life? I felt the call in college, so I was already, um, I was already really thinking. By the time I was in college, I was thinking about how I could, I guess, give my life to a good purpose and not necessarily a religious vocation, but some way of of serving, of helping the human family. So I was thinking about Peace Corps or Volunteer America or something, um, where my life could really be a gift to others. And it was at that time that I, I really felt that the Lord was inviting me to consider religious life. Um, I was thinking only about active religious life at the time. So I immediately considered the gifts that the Lord gives to each person, what gifts he might have given me that could be helpful in the church. Um, and then it was later that the contemplative life opened up and the particular grace for me was this idea that if, if the church needs those to serve in prayer, um, the church also asks that people give their whole life for that service, and that it's really, um, it's powerful, it's hidden, and it's needed, and it's necessary, and I really felt I wanted to be giving that, giving that gift, so. 
And so what has been one of your, I mean, there's so probably many favorite parts yeah. of being, you know, being a part of this community mm -hmm. and feeling, being a bride of Christ. Mm. Um, what's maybe one or two of your favorite parts? Yeah. Mm, when I think about my particular community, I have a lot, I feel a lot to be grateful for with the sisters that I live with, that the sisters that the Lord has given me um, that I didn't choose because you don't choose your, you don't choose your family in the way that you might choose a husband um, when you get married. So you kind of are, are at the disposal of um, the Holy Spirit. And my community is, I think, really unique in that we have an intergenerational and an intercultural community. So we have an age range from 20s to 80s, and we have sisters from different parts of the United States um, Europe and Asia. So it's a small community and yet we represent, we represent different areas of the world and, and ages. And so all that um, will have its challenges, but mostly I experience it as, as a gift. I think we all experience that, the gift of the Lord, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Anything else you want to add? Mm-mm. <laughs> Yes. No, they don't say it. No, well, that's perfect. it. Yeah, thank you. Thank so you. Mm -hmm. yeah. you don't have to. Yeah, you okay. Don't have to. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. That was great. Thank you so much. My name is Sister Marie Louise of the Holy Family. We take a title with our new name. And I have been in Carmel since 2014. And um, I made temporary profession in 2017. So I'm temporary, temporarily professed and I'll, um, I'm preparing for a solemn profession. When do you expect, or God willing, when would your uh, profession be? Mm -hmm. Well, um, I can make it this year. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Exciting. All right. So we'll skip over talking about discalcid. <laughs> <laughs> Discal. You can never it. Um, but so the, the charism of your community is this contemplative prayer. And I think it's Fulton Sheen who says that like the contemplative like orders mm. are what are like kind of the roots of the church that hold, that hold the world mm. together. So as you've been like living this mm. charism, so I'm just changing the question just a little bit. So if you've been, how have you felt that that kind of being mm. rooted, like that, the roots of the church. How have you experienced being the roots of the church in mm. contemplative prayer? Mm. Well, I, I just want to first of all say that, so we, we definitely have um, set times for prayer, you know, so the liturgy of the hours, and then we have our two hours of mental prayer, and, you know, we, um, we celebrate Mass every day, but um, it's so much more, you know, our prayer life is so much more than that. It's, it really, um, the spirit of prayer permeates everything we do in our whole life and it undergirds everything as well. So um, I really appreciate that about our prayer life. And I feel like ever since I've entered the monastery that my heart's kind of expanded for everyone, you know? And I had this idea before I entered of like who I was going to Carmel for, you know? Which is good and necessary. But um, when I entered, I just feel like that kind of exploded. And it's like everyone, everyone is included in that. And um, yeah, so I feel like, you know, Therese says we're the heart of the church. We're, we're pumping the blood for the church. And I, I really like that image, but I also love the image you brought out, the roots of the church as well. So yeah, I feel like um, having people come to us with their intentions and their, their deep faith in our prayers, it's really, has, it's really inspired me as well um, in this vocation, how, how special it is, how privileged I feel to be carrying that with them, you know, so, yeah. Beautiful. Amazing. Okay. So, Therese, you and, and where, where are you from? I'm from Lafayette, Louisiana. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, so, when and how did you feel the call to consecrate? So I, um, I first encountered the sisters here when I was a senior in high school, and it was through a, a friend who was also discerning with the sisters, and she kind of, she kind of came 
back from a meeting with the sisters and she was just on fire. And um, she just looked at me and she said, you could do it, you could be a nun. And so I was like, oh, you know, no one had ever really like told me that or really encouraged me. So um, I was like, yeah, I could do that. So that was kind of like the first, you know, um, seed planted. And then I just came to the sisters, came to one of the Mass of the Roses that we hold here every year. And um, yeah, just kept visiting and kind of fell in love with the community and the charism of prayer. And yeah, that was kind of like it in a nutshell. Beautiful. Wow, that's great. And what's been your favorite part so far of consecrated life or life in community or both? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I kind of touched on it a little bit, but I, I really appreciate, um, because we live the contemplative, contemplative vocation, it's um, very monastic, we live the monastic life, and it's a very, very balanced life. So it's um, the balance of um, work and rest and silence and recreation, which I really appreciate, but um, all of that is undergirded and permeated by prayer. You know, it's all, like everything we do is consecrated for the church, and that, that is just really beautiful for me um, to, to behold that, so. Well, anything else that you want to add? <laughs> No. <laughs> okay. Beautiful. Thank you so much. Yeah. Yeah. Nice job. That was so fun. <laughs> you just put it right there. Or okay. Um, my name is Sister Megan of the Word of God, and I am originally from Lafayette, Louisiana, as well. Actually, we all went to the same high school <laughs> at St. Thomas More. Um, and I am a temporary professed member of our community. I had just made my first profession in December, this past December, 2022. So, yeah. Beautiful. Mm -hmm. And God willing, when would you, when would your next profession? Yeah, so we, whenever we make our first profession, it's for three years, temporary vows. And then um, we, have, we have to be in temporary vows for at least five years, but it's kind of depends on the person. So our full, our full, um, time in temporary vows would be like five to seven or eight years maybe. Um, but I guess doing the math, <laughs> like the earliest that would be, would be like 2027. 20, so. Okay, yeah. beautiful. Mm -hmm. All right. And can you tell me a little bit about living the charism of mm -hmm. mm -hmm. and like, just like the beauty of it for you, mm -hmm. or why it's so beautiful for you? Okay. Um, yeah, I think one, one thing for me that it, it seems to be like a common theme or I always come back to it is like practicing the presence of God and um, and there are a lot of different ways that you could say that um, like things like mindfulness or um, or uh, yeah like just trying to be present to what what you're doing um, and it seems like no matter you know sometimes I'll get into a place where it's like okay, what am I supposed to be doing? And the Lord will send something that's like, oh yeah, that's right. I'm supposed to be like trying to be present to everything that I do and making that, um, making that a prayer in some way. And um, not necessarily saying a prayer every time that I remember that, but just um, trying to be in his presence. And that's something that um, Teresa of Avila, our, found, our foundress of the Discalced Carmelites, she really emphasized like friendship with Christ. And... Um, she has this great line about the Lord walks among the pots and pans. Um, so as some of the other sisters have mentioned already, it's, it's, um, we do have set times for prayer, but what, what is beautiful is, is the, really the space that we're given to, um, to really try to practice like making every moment um, in his presence. And that's like really hard to do actually. <laughs> um, so that's why he's keeping, he keeps having to remind me to return to the, to the practice of it. But I think that's, that's what's really beautiful is that we're given that space to really like live fully um, and live for him and live for the church, for the world, through prayer. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I love that. Um, now you, if you want to kind of put these two questions together, like when and how you felt the call mm -hmm. and how that call was contemplative mm -hmm. rather than active. Yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah. Um, 
So the first time I really felt drawn to, um, to at least a certain religious life was I was in college, and um, I had just taken a class on the theology of the body. <clears throat> Excuse me, theology of the body, and um, it just like blew my mind. Um, and 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 just in my whole college um, experience, anyway, I went out of state, and um, I just I felt like I was learning so much, and it was really enriching my life. And um, I wanted other people to like know these things about our faith, about God, about the truth, about beauty and goodness, and all of this that I was learning. I just. I just had this burning desire that it's like I want everyone to be able to know this. Um, so the first, actually, the first sisters I contacted were the daughters of St. Paul and Metairie. And um, at the time, Sister Tracy Duga was there, and she was so helpful. Um, I really enjoyed my time with them, actually. And but something just didn't it didn't fit right. And um, I also visited um, a Dominican, a group of Dominicans as well. Um, but nothing, it just didn't like, it didn't really click. So I thought well, maybe I'm called to marriage and sort of tabled that. Um, but at the end of college, I, you know, still having that desire to um, like share, share what I had learned. Um, I, I got a teaching job and so back in my hometown and I was in the process of preparing for that. I was really excited about it. Um, that. Yeah, I, I, I kind of had this realization, um, and I had been having it like throughout college, that it's like no matter how many times I would tell someone something, I couldn't make them agree, agree with me. <laughs> um, or I couldn't make them see, I was like, this is beautiful. Why don't, why don't you want to accept this? Um, and I kept running up into that wall, um, just like words not being able to express what I wanted them to say. And I was an English major, so I spent a lot of time with words. and. Um, it's like they just don't get, they don't, you know, say what I want them to say totally, or um, they don't seem to be like getting into the heart of the person. Like how how can I get there? Um, and I I just realized over and over again that you know I could tell someone every day that God loves them, but like unless God's grace was there to like really change that person's heart, it it wasn't gonna happen. Um, and so just one day, uh, I actually I had never thought about the Carmelites at all. And my first kind of like foray into looking into them, I was like, I don't feel called to cloistered life at all. Like, I want to be out like sharing and you know, preaching and telling people the good news. Um, but yeah, it's funny. It's like once I started asking the question, the Lord was like, "Good, she's on the she's on the hunt." So he like boom came um, came with just like this this realization that um, yeah that if the best thing I could do, actually, to accomplish what I really wanted to do was to be prayer. And um, the words from St. Therese's autobiography came back, like, in the heart of my mother, the church, I shall be love. And, yeah, her image of the heart um, pumping blood to the body, um, that just really spoke to me. And I really realized in that moment that, yeah, the, the most powerful thing I can do is offer a life of prayer and sacrifice and just like trust that the Lord will use that in whatever way to um, reach into people's hearts and change them. Uh, so yeah, that, that's kind of how I made the switch <laughs> over to contemplative life. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. Oh, I love that. All right. And just what, what has your favorite part of uh, community been or are you, when you make the temporary vows, are you now a bride of Christ? Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, so yeah. So what, what then has been your favorite part of either being a bride of Christ or being mm -hmm. in community or both? Yeah, I really think um, Carmelite life is like so exciting. <laughs> it might not seem like that would be the case, um, but there's always something happening and um, it, it might be like, you know, physical things happening, like um, we might have a special event like honoring a saint or like St. Therese, we have the Mass of the Roses every year. So that's something that happens. Um, but I mean, it's always, it's always something. Like if it's, uh, if it's not a leaky faucet, it's, you know, we've got, we've got this problem we've got to tackle or, um, or there's this project we're working on. Um, so it's always, 
it's, it's never dull, ever. <laughs> it's never dull. And, um, and so in that, I think what's really beautiful is like, again, kind of like I said at the beginning, is the, the invitation to, um, one, try to receive all of it as like something from the Lord, um, even though it may not seem like this is something, it's like that, that doesn't seem right, or like maybe, yeah, it, it might be surprising or um, something not expected. You know, when I was thinking about the life of Carmel, I did not expect to have so much that was always happening um, all the time. But, but really, like the Lord, the Lord works in such mysterious ways. And again, it's like the beauty of the space that we're given in Carmel um, for that silence and solitude that we, we get to like um, listen more deeply and see how God is like working in all of these things. Um, so the, the smallest encounter, the most random like thing that needs to be fixed, it's like I can take that to prayer and like, yeah, the Lord has spoken to me through those things and like really small lessons, but that meant a lot um, or that really kind of changed the way I was doing something. So yeah, I guess it's just the combination of this life is, there's always something and trying to find the Lord in it. I think that that's, it's really, it, it can be adventurous when it's looked at like that. Scene four alpha, take one. Boom. Let's do it. That's awesome. That was solid. I think that was the best The best part about all that is it makes y'all laugh and then I stitch that into everything and they're like, oh look, there's something. I'm like, yeah, they are. My name is Sister Rose. I'm from Lafayette, Louisiana. And I entered here in January of 2022. And I'm a novice. I entered the novitiate uh, in January of this past year, and it's usually a two-year formation period before you take temporary vows. Or, mm -hmm. what has that transition been like of being mm -hmm. into being um, a novice, right. not a novice? So the transition from postulancy to novitiate has been um, really beautiful. There's the Obviously, you, get, you receive the habit, and something that I really loved while I was becoming familiar with the writings of the Carmelite saints, especially Teresa of Avila, before I entered, was how often she called our habit the habit of Our Lady, and, um, and the way that um, it's, really, it's really a symbol of Our Lady's patronage and protection, um, her motherly care for us. and. It was my kind of desire for Our Lady to be a mother for me that um, had led me to grow closer to Christ. So finding that in the writings of our Holy Mother, St. Teresa, um, just made me love the Carmelite order even more. Like it really attracted me to it. So receiving the habit has been such a blessing because, um, you know, we have this tangible reminder of Our Lady's protection with us. That's been a real grace. And um, the beautiful thing about being a Discalced Carmelite nun is that even though I, um, you know, I, I moved from stage to stage and I was a postulant and now I'm a novice, um, the life, there's, you're already living the life from the moment that you enter. And so now it's, it's still learning and growing. It's getting to know my sisters more. It's becoming more familiar with um, a life that allows me to listen to the voice of Christ so deeply throughout the day. Um, so it's really just been a deepening. And, and the graces, there, there have been graces um, kind of particular to each stage, but, but they've been continuous, you know. Mm -hmm. over active. Right. I felt called to religious life, or I felt attracted to religious life starting in college. Um, I was familiar already with religious life because my older sister had actually discerned religious life when we were in high school. And in fact, she had discerned at this community for a little while. And um, so I got to meet the sisters. And even after she was no longer discerning with them, I, I still encountered them 
at different events like Mass of the Roses. And um, I just really, I had a love for the sisters themselves, but I had no attraction whatsoever to um, the idea of becoming a contemplative nun. Um, I, I wanted to serve God and I, I dedicated a lot of time in my life and arranged arrange my activities really to be serving him as much as possible. Um, but I, I, even as I started to think about religious life in college, I was attracted to the idea of an active order because I thought, I thought since I was already familiar with this beautiful community of contemplative woman, women and had no desire whatsoever um, to, to live the life, I thought, you know, I could, at least I can narrow it down from from all the religious orders in the world, at least I know that I don't um, need to look at all of the contemplative orders because I've already discerned that, right? Um, so, so I was discerning with an active order. Um, and what really attracted me to religious life is, the, is seeing religious women and the way that they just exuded the presence of God um, and the way that, that their relationship with the Lord was so personal and so real. To, to him, Jesus was a person, and he was their friend and their spouse. And I thought that that was really incredible, because for me, my relationship with God was doing things for God and earning God's attention. But, um, but they, they seemed to have it already, you know? And I... So I was attracted to religious life initially more, I think, as a lifestyle that I wanted to become my own so that I could discover Jesus as a person, as a friend. Um, however, after um, discerning and discerning and taking that journey, which led me to start working at a school because I wanted, I wanted experience at a school if I was going to enter religious life, and become a teacher as an active sister, um, I wanted to, to kind of try it out and see, see how I liked it. Well, I love teaching, and I, I thought, okay, I'm, I'm teaching, I have this wonderful Catholic community, I have good friends, we pray together, um, I'm, I'm glowing, growing closer to Jesus through my workplace, through my relationships, Maybe this is where God is calling me to be. Maybe this is, um, God wants to sanctify my life here in the world. So, so I was at peace with that. And then in the spring of 2020, when the pandemic started, I could no longer pray in a chapel. I could no longer go to daily mass. Um, so if I wanted to talk to the Lord, I had to believe that he was present to me. So for the first time, I, I had to pray as if I believed that the Lord really dwelt inside of me, which we know at our baptism, we receive the gift of the indwelling Trinity. But to me, that was like not, that was such a vague, that was such a vague teaching that I had never really internalized or really acted upon, really never had to act upon because the Lord was in the tabernacle, you know, the Lord was on the altar. Um, so, being in that space where I was forced to seek the Lord within myself um, and having, having already been reading the, reading the writings of St. Teresa of Avila where she teaches us in prayer not just to say words but to be aware that we're speaking to a person um, and be aware of what we're saying and what we're asking, who we're asking and who's asking it. Um, it completely changed my prayer life and then all of a sudden I had all of this time to pray so I was, having, I was having this time with the Lord as a friend and exercising my faith that he was really present in my soul, like in my soul. I had to exercise the faith that I was, I was worthy to be his dwelling. And um, yeah, the Lord responded to that with so much joy, like receiving me with so much joy. So um, after that, it became very clear to me that nothing else would satisfy me except being totally his and um, having my entire life oriented to listening to him and serving him. And even as I was um, continuing to work as a teacher the next year and um, being so blessed in that, 
I just continued to have this ache to be with the Lord in prayer. And I knew that um, this was something that could only be fulfilled if I were totally His um, in con contemplative life. Beautiful. <clears throat> and what has your favorite part been so far now that you're, now that you're here and inhabited? And My favorite part. <laughs> My favorite part of being in Carmel so far um, is kind of under the umbrella, I guess, of um, living a life of prayer. I am so grateful for our the space for prayer in our life, for the silence and solitude. Um, but, but something that's been really exciting for me since I entered is discovering the liturgy in a way that feels like uh, it's for the first time. Um, even though I was attending Mass, daily before I entered, I, um, I wasn't praying with, I wasn't praying so much with the readings outside of Mass, and I was paying very little attention to any of the prayers or the antiphons during Mass, unless one of them just happened to strike me in a moment where I might have been paying closer attention. But being in Carmel, since we have the space to, um, to really prepare for the holy sacrifice of the Mass, and to continue to live it out throughout the day um, by praying the Liturgy of the Hours and by living out the graces of the Mass, to prepare for Mass the next day by praying the Liturgy of the Hours and continuing our prayer and our work. Um, I was able to see, first of all, the beauty of the, the readings that are chosen for Mass and the rhythm of the liturgical year. Is, is something that is so beautiful to me that I was not aware of before. Um, and, and so I was kind of picking this up throughout the previous year in um, 2022 during my postulancy. And so my first advent in Carmel, I was already in the habit of, of getting familiar with the mass readings before mass. So I discovered during advent that each day you have these particular prayers, these particular antiphons for this day. Um, and each day was so rich and so beautiful. It was so exciting to me to see, like, there's this wealth of treasure here that I had no idea about. And, um, and there's so much more to discover. So, so yeah, that's something that I've really appreciated.